everybody. I'm Liz Cohen. I'm the Dean at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon for a very special presentation. Um, I want to extend a particularly warm welcome to members of the Radcliffe Institute's Associates Program who are joining us here today. And I want to just convey to them how much I appreciate their support. Um, I also want to extend a welcome to our speaker, Linda Gordon, who is University Press Professor of the Humanities and the Florence Kelly Professor of History at NYU, and is a fellow this year at the Radcliffe Institute as uh, the Matina Horner Distinguished Visiting Professor. That's the official title for her fellowship. But Linda is not new to Radcliffe. As a pioneering scholar in women's history, Linda has been a regular at the Schlesinger Library for many years, using the library's rich collections to produce several of her award-winning books. For a 20th century US historian like myself, Linda's books on subjects that range widely from the history of birth control, family violence, and women and welfare, um, to race and adoption, and most recently, what we will hear about today, photographer Dorothea Lange, she has made enormous contributions to the field, and her work has greatly inspired me and all of my students. Linda's presentation today focuses on photographer Dorothea Lange, whose photographs, such as the very famous migrant mother portrait that we see here on the screen, helped put a human face on the economic devastation caused by the Great Depression of the 1930s. Lang became not simply a recorder of human misery, but a powerful advocate for Americans, particularly women, who faced new kinds of dislocation and injustice as a result of the nation's financial crisis. In a moment, you're going to hear more about Linda and her work from Nancy Cott, the Carl and Lily Fortzheimer Foundation Director of the Schlesinger Library, and the Jonathan Trumbull Professor of American History at Harvard. But first, I'd like to say a few words about the Institute's work and some upcoming events that relate quite closely to today's talk. Linda's lecture about Dorothea Lange highlights the Institute's commitment to the study of women, women, gender, and society. This December, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the Schlesinger Library with a symposium honoring uh, the pioneering women's historian, Gerda Lerner, and reflecting on the current state of women's history. This, this past fall, we, we celebrated two other important anniversaries. The 50th anniversary of the publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, and the 50th anniversary of the 1963 report by President Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Women. And we were particularly honored to have Democratic House Leader Nancy Pelosi with us on the anniversary of the Commission's report to discuss her experience as a legislator today working on issues related to women in the workplace, women in education, and women under the law. The Institute's work stretches far beyond the focus, though, of women, gender, and society. And we are proud to have scholars, scientists, artists, and public intellectuals from the United States and really around the world among our 50 fellows uh, here with us this year. And we host events on topics that range across all discipline and the arts. From our Smart Clothes uh, Science Symposium of last fall on wearable technology and material science, to last week's wonderful conversation, if you were lucky enough to be here with uh, artist uh, Judy Chicago, we are committed to supporting cutting edge scholarship on many subjects and sharing it with the public through our extensive public programming. Now, returning to Linda Gordon's lecture, uh, Nancy Cott will now give Linda a proper introduction. Um, Nancy's own scholarship is wide ranging. She's focused on gender, social movements, political culture, law, and citizenship. And she is one of the preeminent historians of uh, American women. Nancy, together with Marilyn Dunn, who is the executive director of the Schlesinger Library and their staff, not only steward our treasure trove of historical material in the library, but they work very hard to bring it to life and to you through public programs, exhibitions, lectures, symposia, and so forth. And today is very much in that spirit. So I'll turn things over to Nancy. 
Hi, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to be here and really delighted to introduce Linda Gordon. She is one of the most important scholars contributing to the field of United States history today. Uh, through her scholarly books, her frequent lectures and journal articles, she's had a formative influence on historical study for 40 years. Gordon's very wide-ranging knowledge began with her training in European and Russian history before she moved into the US history field, which she did at the time of the women's movement about 1970. Her pioneering theoretical articles and her first book, Woman's Body, Woman's Right, that's the uh, book on the birth control movement, established her immediately as a shaper of the then new field of women's history. Linda's remarkable and continuing stream of articles and prize-winning books has brought her huge and deserved influence in 20th century US political and social history. After Woman's Body, Woman's Right, which uh, has she, she re, uh, revised and reissued under the title The Moral Property of Women um, just a, I don't know, a few years ago, within the last decade. Then she wrote Heroes of Their Own Lives, which was a social and political history of domestic violence from the point of view of its victims. Then Pitied But Not Entitled, uh, in which she placed single mothers in history in a way that they never had been, while at the same time reconceiving and newly stating the role of women reformers in the New Deal, in the making of the New Deal. And as those books' topics suggest, Linda has typically devoted herself to unfinished histories, that is, subjects still arousing controversy and needing resolutions today. Her next project, while similarly motivated, looked entirely different from what she had done before in both setting and narrative. This was called The Great Orphan Abduction. It was a story of the American West, a micro history, a Mexican American and Irish American story, a labor history about the paid work of minors and the unpaid work of their wives, yet equally a history involving racial and religious friction as well as class and gender misperceptions and misunderstandings. There, she told a gripping story and at the same time covered complicated historical terrain with remarkable subtlety and insight with an astonishing simultaneity of gender, class, ethnicity, and regional analysis. That book won the Bancroft Prize in 2000. Um, this is a much coveted prize for the best book in American history given by Columbia University. And though she had gone in directions unforeseen when she did her PhD, in 2002, the Yale Graduate School, that is where she got her PhD, the Yale Graduate School Alumni Association awarded her its highest honor, the Wilbur Cross Medal. She embarked on a study different, again, from her earlier work when she decided to write the biography of Dorothea Lange. Biography as a genre was very far from what she had done earlier, and Lange was in the arts, whereas Linda had never written on high culture. But as in her other books, she showed herself capable of the imaginative leaps into the lives of her historical subject that creates the best history. In moving to the biographical genre, Linda amplified it, designing her study, of course, to elucidate Lang's life, but also to interpret its broad social and historical meanings in the context of her times. Her success registered in the books winning the Bancroft Prize a second time in 2010. This is something no other historian has done in the past half century. And in fact, only one person at all besides Linda in the history of the prize. Linda also has a new book just coming out or about to be out, co-authored with two others. It's called Feminism Unfinished, A Short Surprising History of American Women's Movements. I'm looking forward to reading that. 
Uh, and as a Radcliffe Institute fellow, she's working on yet another project, a book of broad scope and purpose, a history of social movements in the United States. In short, the breadth of Linda Gordon's interests and publications has been extraordinary. And the results of her scholarship have been transformative. In the end of her biography of Dorothea Lange, uh, Linda says Lange was a photographer of democracy. She herself has been a historian of democracy. And I am feeling very fortunate that we are all here to hear her today. So, Linda. Oh, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, I want to thank everyone who trekked here today. Uh, I want to thank Nancy Cott, um, not only for uh, the kind of introduction that one would die for, but also for her superb leadership of an institution, the Schlesinger Library, that has meant so much to so many scholars working to unearth, unearth the history of women. And I definitely need to thank the Radcliffe Institute. Uh, I think that I can say for all 50 of us fellows that this, this gift, this year to concentrate on our own work is literally priceless. Uh, quite beyond the world of things that you can buy with money. Um, I like to think of the Institute's fellowship program as an affirmation of the importance of arts and, uh, and learning uh, to our country. Um, now for Dorothea Lang. I always have to start with this photograph uh, because so many people don't know her name, but everyone knows this photograph. This is the most famous photograph in America. The reason that her name is so often unknown uh, is part of the story that I'll be telling. Today, the social relevance of her work could hardly be greater because she was picturing an economic depression, that of the 1930s, with part of her career. But I have been equally interested in her artistic relevance, as she was, I think, the first photographer to demonstrate definitively that what is documentary can also be art. I titled this lecture Visual Democracy because I think she was attempting to make the democratic possibilities of this country visual. She was confronting um, some of the same obstacles to democracy that remain today. Uh, I think she was aware, consciously and unconsciously, that the majority of Americans, uh, that is, all people of color and white women as well, were not yet in the 1930s full citizens. And she sought to use these images to force other people to recognize their citizenship. And by citizenship, I should say that I mean, of course, not a set of documents, uh, but something much more important, the position of being recognized as an equal and an active member of the polity. Um, in part, because she did representational photography, she never did montage, she never did surrealism, she never did abstraction. Because of that, I think many people have misconceived her work. Uh, many assume, and these are uh, quotes from people, that her work was naive, that it was <clears throat> instinctive, just as they assumed that what do documentary does is to report or to replicate what is, quote, out there. In fact, photographers construct pictures just as much as any painter constructs a painting. Um, let's see, let's use this. Just a very few words about her biography, because I really want to spend most of my time on the photographer. She, uh, photography. She was a middle-class child of, of German uh, origin, Lutheran uh, parents in Hoboken, New Jersey, born in 1895. Her mother sang in the church choir. Her father was a lawyer. Her grandmother lived with them. Altogether, this was a very respectable and uh, fairly normal middle-class family. But there was another side of her consciousness, uh, and I'm going to leap to later in her life to tell you just a little story. 
in the 1950s, she taught photography at the California School of the Arts in San Francisco, and one of her favorite exercises was to assign her students to photograph where you live. And by that, she did not mean your apartment. She meant something far deeper about the basic circumstances of her, your life. So one year, her students challenged her to bring a photograph of where she lived. And this is what she brought. She was a polio victim. She was a disabled woman. She had a wizened lower right leg, and she could not put her, the heel of that foot on the ground. Uh, she limped. Um, in so, some, another girl might have been weakened by this disability, especially because her mother was extremely embarrassed and worried about it, worried that Dorothea would be stigmatized and that she would be unmarriageable. So her mother pressed on her over and over again that she needed to disguise uh, this limp. And as soon as skirts got shorter, she started to wear pants, not as a feminist act, but as a way to disguise this. Even so, from the age of 12, she start, developed the practice of wandering alone the streets of New York City. First the Lower East Side, then the upper, where she attended middle school, then the Upper West Side, where she attended high school, and ultimately the entire island of Manhattan. She was a walker in the city. She was also an autodidact. She was a mediocre student. She did not attend college, but she discovered on her own the modern art that was blossoming in New York. She taught herself photography by taking jobs as photographic assistants in various portrait studios, and it was characteristic of Dorothea that at one point she simply walked into the shop of the nation's most illustrious portrait photographer, Arnold Genthy, and asked for a job, and she got it, and he gradually let her do some photography and finally gave her a cast-off camera. She moved to San Francisco in 1918, and she soon opened a photography studio at an upscale location. Within two years, she had become the portrait photographer for San Francisco's wealthy arts patrons, prominently the major German Jewish families of San Francisco, the Levi's and the Strausses, the Fleischackers, for those of you who know California. Um, I think her success derived from the conjunction of a charismatic personality and a modernist visual sophistication. Um, these are two of her studio portraits, and I'll tell you a bit about them in a minute. She attracted elite arty clients with a bohemian elegance in her personal style, but above all with her photographs. She never used the painted backgrounds or the props that were common at the time. She discouraged formal poses. She did not ask people to smile. She preferred them to wear old clothes because it would make them more relaxed. She used dramatic shadows and unusual angles and created emotion and sometimes mystery. What you have here at the bottom is a, a picture of the composer Ernest Bloch. Um, at the top, the teenage daughter of uh, Levi Strauss family, and I don't know if you can tell from this cropping of the photograph, but she is sitting on her horse. And this photograph, I think, is characteristic of something that Lang did a lot. She's, she's presented with a sullen teenager whose parents want her to get a photograph made, but she is absolutely not interested. But instead of wheedling her into smiling, she photographs her just as she is, sullen, uh, the essence of this kind of teenager, but at the same time, quite beautiful. The elite reputation and clientele that she got, I think, derived from her sensitivity to the class taste of her clients. Her work represented the acme of individualism in portraiture. She thought of her pictures as revealing individuality and a deep inner life. Um, she endowed her subjects with interiority. Her clients believed that she had a unique power to capture their true essence. 
and that their education, their culture, and their sensitivity would shine out from these photographs when they mounted them and put them on their pianos or on their mantle. Uh, she uh, began to integrate herself, as she had done in New York, into a bohemian arts crowd. And in 1920, a year and a half after she arrived, she married the city's most desirable bachelor artist, Maynard Dixon. He was probably the best known artist in San Francisco at the time. He was 20 years her senior. He always dressed in black with cowboy boots and a hat, a dashing and magnetic figure at the center of this crowd. This small, limping, photographic businesswoman had hooked the sexiest man in San Francisco. She adored him, but this was not an easy marriage. She was not only the exclusive housekeeper and parent of three, she not only put up with his womanizing and his months-long absence on painting trips, but she was also the one who earned the living that allowed him to paint. Um, I think he was the husband from hell, if you will. Excuse my, <laughs> excuse my technical language. Um, when the Depression hit, when the streets of San Francisco were teeming with the hungry, the homeless, and the angry, her portrait studio began to seem confining. She took her heavy camera out into the city to photograph the men sleeping on park benches, the crowds lining up at relief stations, the demonstrations, and the pitched battles with police. These were somber, pessimistic photographs, but she found, to her surprise, that she was happier doing that than she'd been in the studio. I, I want to call your attention to one thing about this composition. And I'm going to do it by going back to this. This is actually uh, closer in, but it is the same composition. It is one face with other people whose faces you don't see. Um, you'll see more of this. Um, this is uh, something that is very characteristic, uh, that even, even the one face, you only see half of it. And she has been able to pick this face or this man out of a crowd and to use him to make a very powerful photograph. At first, photographing on the streets was very uh, discomforting for her because she was used to people who paid her to make their photograph. And she worried that she was invading people's privacy. And it took a while for her to grow more relaxed. And finally, she did. And she said later, and I'm going to quote, I can only say that I knew I was looking at something important. You know then that you are not taking away anything from anyone, not their privacy, not their dignity, not their wholeness. Her whole photographic future rested on that, uh, that comforting I idea. Then, documentary photographer, photography connected her to another very extraordinary man who became her second husband and her partner in life for the rest of her life. This was uh, an unlikely at first husband for Dorothea Lang. Paul Taylor was a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. But he was a professor of agricultural economics, and particularly someone who specialized in studying agricultural labor. And it was he that got Dorothea her first federal job, working for the Farm Security Administration uh, within the Department of Agriculture. Um, within the Farm Security Administration, there was a very small project of photographing the impact of the Depression on rural life in America. This is a little bit of a paradox for a girl who had never lived outside of a city and who said about this that she could hardly tell a mule from a horse. Um, but for six years, this small and amazingly hardworking group of about a dozen photographers made several hundred thousand photographs of American rural life. 
The project was initiated to create propaganda for Roosevelt's New Deal agricultural policy, but Lang, among other photographers, but Lang particularly expanded it to uh, something really quite extraordinary. Now, there are several paradoxes in her life, but my favorite concerns what constituted liberation for this woman. In the usual modern story, women get emancipated when they leave off their dependence on a husband. Lang reversed it. She got the opportunity to become a great photographer because her second husband could support her um, and relieve her of the responsibility of earning. And without him and without the federal government, you would never have heard of Dorothy Lang or seen any of her photography. Um, her career itself um, was, as I said, full of these paradoxes, and it was a paradox that was characteristic of all the photographers. They were photographing the countryside. They were all extremely urban. Um, the project was started by a very creative Under Secretary of Agriculture, Rexford Tugwell. Um, their project became a visual encyclopedia of um, rural America. And something I'd just like to point out to you all, all this all these several hundred thousand photographs are in the Library of Congress. And they are free to anyone to use, to uh, take the scans, to print out. They are the property of the American people. The project put its photographers on the road, sometimes for months at a time. And the excursions, particularly Lang's, were grueling. She traveled repeatedly through the Imperial Valley and the San Joaquin Valley in California, photographing migrant farm workers and Dust Bowl refugees in the scorching heat of summers before air conditioning. She slept in cheap motels. She developed film in motel bathrooms with no ventilation. She constantly worried that the heat or the dust would damage her film. She trudged dirt roads and walked into fields with equipment uh, weighing well over 50 pounds. Uh, I would add here that she never used a 35 millimeter camera, but used very heavy cameras with plate film that uh, slid in and out. If you look there, you can get a sense of the kind of camera that she was using. She moved also throughout the Deep South, braving Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama white hostility as she photographed sharecroppers and wage laborers who were growing cotton. In one summer alone, 1936, she logged 17,000 miles on her old station wagon. She climbed on top frequently because she was a relatively short person, but also because she wanted uh, the height for a view. The job was difficult in other ways. She was not only during this, her period, the only woman photographer, but she was also the only parent. And by now, there were six kids because in addition to the three that she had with Dixon, there were Paul Taylor's three who lived with them. She had to spend weeks and occasionally months away from her children and she suffered her guilt and their resentment for decades. The greater part of her conflict came from knowing that she was guilty of that greatest of all female vices, ambition. But she simply could not say no to this opportunity. And she was right. Every farm security photographer remembered this as the best years of their lives. When they got married in the morning, she and Paul Taylor went back to work in the field in the afternoon. And this was not unromantic. For them, this was a part of their romance. They felt themselves to be part of a social movement. Tens of thousands of artists, photographers, prominent among them, were trying to make their work serve the New Deal agenda in the 1930s. The FSA distributed these photographs free of charge to magazines, organizations, government agencies, and even individuals. And Lang, uh, Lang's were at, by far the most popular. 
The original assignment was that they were supposed to document things like soil erosion, the, the flow of the dust that covered barns, and so on. But Lang uh, did that at first, but she soon fell back, or rather stepped back, into her fort, which was portraiture. She was always a portrait photographer. And what she was doing was simply turning, I think, toward the poor, the same eye that she had previously directed toward the rich. And what I've done in this photograph, in this slide, and the next one is I've paired a photograph from her studio days with a photograph of uh, a sharecropper or a migrant farm worker. She was making portraits of these poor rural workers within the same visual conventions that she used in the studio. But the change in subject matter made them, at that time, startling, gripping. And soon, she began to influence other farm security photographers, and a new style was ironically being developed in the federal government. Hardly the place you expect new artistic styles to come from. I think one of the things, this is another one, um, comparing a studio portrait with a, a, a farm worker child. Um, I think Central Tier's style was, so to speak, documenting poverty and injustice in pictures that were at the same time as photographs beautiful. They give the viewer pleasure along with education and emotion. Her subjects are always attractive and I at first wondered about that, and it's quite possible that she just refused to photograph people that she didn't think were attractive. But she also seemed to be able to make everyone attractive. She actually said that she believed in making flattering photographs, and she had an analysis which is actually of great interest to me because it's an analysis that has since been formally theorized by Ariel Azoulay. I don't know if any of you know the work of this photographic critic, and that is that a photograph, a portrait, is a collaboration between a photographer and her subject. And because it's a collaboration, she thought that her subjects had every right to demand an image of themselves that they would like. The same thing, of course, that she did in the studio. Um, she always avoided flash bulbs. Um, she never uh, photographed indoors for that reason because she didn't like the impact of the flash on uh, the subject. Uh, but even this outdoor work was not difficult because there were no light meters in those days. And this is one of the reasons that she often made many, many, many exposures, uh, not really knowing which one was going to turn out best. But she also developed a technique which um, you can partly see in this photograph. And that is that she wanted to, she, she knew, like all the portrait studio photographers, that most people tense up in front of a camera. And the job is to get them to relax. And she did this in several ways. She did it by conversing with them. Paul Taylor sometimes traveled with her, and he helped because he was fluent in Spanish and could speak with a lot of these people, like this uh, Mexican-American cotton picker and her daughter. Um, she, um, she also, I think, strategically um, exa uh, exaggerated her disability and her slowness of movement. And she would set up her, tri she usually used a tripod in one place, and then she would shake her head, that was no good, and she'd set it in another. And she had a whole litany that she writes about of standard questions. She would ask for a drink of water. This is a scorching hot, dry place. These people are very, very gracious. They will always bring you a, a scoop of water from the water barrel. Or she would ask, how far is it to the next town? Or what was the last kind of crop that you picked? And so on. Um, she believed that only when you got people to relax into what she called their natural body language, and you'll hear more about body later, only then could she make a, re uh, a revealing photograph. But in the Depression political context, making her subjects attractive was also a New Dealer's political statement, because associating the poor with beauty was a democratic assertion. 
These handsome farm workers could be said to argue a New Deal analysis of, um, of the Depression. Previous charity um, almost always assumed that the poor were poor in at least large part because of moral or characterological defects laziness, immorality, etc. New Deal relief programs broke decisively with that tradition to some extent, and they simply provided people material aid without any moralizing. They rested on the premise that the crisis was beyond the ability of individuals to cope with, and it was the economy, not the individual, that needed structural repair. So she needed to show that those who appeared disheveled and worn down might nevertheless have strong foundations and the capacity for recovery with just a bit of help. She was trying to present them as deserving people who worked hard. And these victims had to be attractive if they were to evoke sympathy, not to mention generosity. Uh, now, many artists face a similar challenge but unfortunately, I think many of that period tried to counter negative stereotypes with positive stereotypes. If you look at uh, these photographs today, I think you can see Lang's strong resistance to stereotypes. She once said when she first entered the South that it was so much harder to photograph in the South because it was too picturesque. And the picturesque, by what, what she meant by that, was that it's sentimental and was a, a block to a, a deeper, more truthful photography. Each of her subjects comes to us as an individual and unique. Perhaps by conversing with them, she also shows us their thoughtfulness. They might be ragged, but they are actually rather interesting. They are never wretched. She became an expert at providing context without erasing her subjects' individuality or reducing them to types. She believed, that I think, that this individualization was an essential ingredient of democracy because it calls for respect of the other person. Um, now, some have argued that because poverty, in fact, is rarely beautiful, that Lang's attractive portraits of the poor were inauthentic or even dishonest. Um, I think that one of the things that that argument led me to think about is the fact that she's not just making images of people as they are, but of their potential. And the potential of these marginalized people it seems to me was basic in her understanding of democracy. I haven't really identified the last few photographs. This is, a, um, I believe, a North Carolina tobacco farm sharecropper, uh, a Filipino California migrant farm worker working in the lettuce fields, uh, this is one of the people who are, quote, Okies, the refugees from the Dust Bowl who moved west into California in this period. Um, in this emphasis on potential, Lang's approach was not completely dissimilar to Soviet socialist realist art of the period. In that genre, r workers were romanticized, and their romanticization was justified by the premise that the art was designed to help build the socialist future. But Lang's vis vision actually involves something that is entirely missing in, the, in socialist realist art, and that is a vision of people as multifaceted, troubled, conflicted, even enigmatic. She remarked once that, that documentary photography should ask questions, not give answers. And I think this is the hallmark of her portraiture, in that we can never be completely confident that we entirely understand these people or know what they are thinking. They retain some mystery that is the core of what makes them subjects, not just objects of pity. And it's this attraction to complexity, I think, that allowed her to achieve emotional power while stopping short of sentimentality. Um, 
what I want to do in the rest of this talk is to examine the photography in four categories, three uh, categories that are part of this democratic vision, and finally, um, uh, something I'm very interested in, which is Lang's interest in the body as opposed to the face. The first of, part of this democratic vision uh, is already obvious to you, and that is uh, respect for labor. Uh, her laborers were primarily farm workers. Uh, although, in, all, in addition to all these photographs of people hoeing cotton, picking cotton, weighing cotton, planting, sorting, etc., there are also the photographs, like you see at the top, of people doing domestic labor. And in Lang's caption to that photograph, she, she wrote because she wanted us to know that that woman is a grandmother who is doing the migrant family's wash in the, uh, in the tub. Um, much of this kind of work is usually classified and is actually still classified in Department of Labor Statistics as unskilled. Uh, a designation that I think does not describe actual skill, but rather encodes a hierarchy of status and power. Influenced by Paul Taylor, Lang tried to use her captions to challenge this. When she photographed tobacco culture in North Carolina, for example, she wrote a, quote, caption that was a thousand words long that documented every stage of the complex process of growing tobacco from planting through curing. Um, her respect for working people jibed with her admiration for Franklin Roosevelt and for the New Deal. And that political sensitivity, I, sensibility rather, I call for short, populist nationalism. It constructed American character as uh, not only politically unique, but politically superior with the idea that the US was founded in democracy and that Americans had a special talent for democracy. But in the 1930s, the dominant conceptions of the nation had a very strong stream of racism. If you look, for example, at the public art paintings, the thousands of New Deal murals that were painted in post offices and schools and so on, you will find it very hard to find a person that is not white. Um, American, particularly in the West, meant white. And uh, all of the peoples of color around where Lang lived, that is Mexican Americans, Filipino Americans, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, were none of them considered Mer American. Um, Virtually every single New Deal program uh, discriminated against people of color. Lang's vision, by contrast, is really striking for its racial inclusiveness. Um, one uh, scholar, not me, uh, uh, curator of photographs at the National Archives, actually counted and uh, determined that 31% of her subjects were people of color, but not a single one of them was distributed in the New Deal. Uh, her boss believed that America was not ready for photographs of people of color, and that since the point of this whole project was to develop support for Roosevelt's uh, agenda, you could only develop that support by picturing white people. Um, but my argument about her attitude toward these people is actually more qualitative than it is quantitative, because I think, as I implied before, that she's trying to draw these poor people into citizenship. That by making them deliberative and thoughtful, she is suggesting that they are citizens. Their attractiveness and confidence derives from the way that she framed them, giving them often the dignity of centrality with a full and carefully composed frame, often as with the man at the bottom shooting a little bit from below, which is partly a, a technical matter because she held her camera at her waist and looked down into it rather than... Uh, and that was also a factor that made it, of course, much easier to converse with people, the fact that the camera is not in front of your face. Um, her photographs are not only lovely, but they are also 
easy. They're easy to understand. It was in many ways a very conventional photography. Her designs and images remained well inside the vernacular, commercial, and Christian visual culture. Um, these pictures, as I mentioned before, are satisfying even as they register problems in rural America. The people are somewhat reserved. They are never ingratiating. They are often meditative. They don't expose themselves. They're not simple. Uh, the picture on the bottom uh, interests me a lot. This is a, a Mexican-American migrant farm worker who is resting under some trees in the shade in the middle of the day. And she wanted to photograph him, but instead of asking him to sit or stand up, she just conducts this conversation with him lying on the ground and photographs him lying on the ground. Uh, to appreciate this vision also, you have to keep in mind how rarely American white people at this time ever saw respectful images of people of color and how widely circulated at this time were very ugly caricatures of black people and other non-white people. Now, she could photograph people of color, but she also tried to photograph racism, and in this, I think, she failed. This is one of very, very few photographs that I think does uh, what she was trying to do, because this is a Mississippi plantation owner. Uh, and if you look very carefully, you will see on the left a sliver of Paul Taylor, who is uh, conversing with this guy. Uh, and you can see I took this from a contact print, not from a, she probably would have cropped Paul Taylor out in producing a photograph. but. What makes this work is that you have the plantation owner in the front in a rather aggressive posture, and behind him you have his croppers who are receding, but they are at the same time curious, and many of them are looking at the photographer. And so what she has managed to do is to create a, a photograph in which the spatial uh, relations replicate the power relations that actually exist in the society, but that is a very, very difficult thing to do uh, unless you're involved in posing people. Now, this anti-racism also led her to what I think of as a really remarkable act, and that is her uh, strongly critical photography of the Japanese internment. Uh, you'll remember that in World, at the beginning of World War II, President Roosevelt ordered the internment of all Japanese Americans on the West Coast, 120,000 people, three-fifths of whom were citizens, without any hint of disloyalty, let alone any charges. And they hired her to document this, uh, this process. First, she documented the rounding up of these people, relying on her by now characteristic mode of composition, picking an individual out of a crowd. That is her cropping of what was probably a much, uh, there were many more people probably in originally. Um, it, it reminds us of something that I'll come back to, and that is that the crucial skill in great photography like this does not involve the camera, does not involve the darkroom, it involves the eye, the being able to see and register what is going to make a great picture. But she also did something else here that she does a lot, which is uh, in liter literature called synecdoche, which is using a, a small thing as a symbol for the whole. And she did many, many photographs of people who were tagged like that. These people were tagged like packages to be sent along and processed, and they were each given numbers. And so the male head of household would be 10512A, and the wife would be 10512B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And she understood that as symbolic of the dehumanization and humiliation of the process. At the same time, she was quite willing to 
desert her usual compositional care just to show the reality of the internment camps. To appreciate this work, you need to register how nearly universal support for this internment policy was for the political, from the political right to the political left, at least among white people. Even the Communist Party, which fought so hard against black racism, not only supported the internment, but expelled its Asian American members. And even before the internment was announced, the city of San Francisco removed Japanese American children from its classrooms. Um, further to point out um, what I think is the significance of this, I, I just want to mention, uh, in case you haven't registered it, that clearly part of her tremendous uh, cathexis with Franklin Roosevelt was that he was a president who was a fellow polio victim. Uh, this was of extraordinary uh, meaning to her. But when she was able, uh, as she was occasionally, to do portraits, um, you have the same characteristic style. Uh, the people are dignified, complex, thoughtful, and always individuals. Toward the end of her life, she accompanied her husband to Asia, where he was a, a um, consultant on land reform for the USAID and for the UN. But there she was handicapped by her inability to get close enough to make portraits. She could not speak the language. She did not necessarily feel safe walking around a lot of these cities as a lone woman. So here she began to do something quite unexpected, which was to transform her subject matter, matter and to um, communicate precisely her distance from these people precisely the fact that she could not really see these people. And she has many of these photographs of veiled people, including this, this one woman who obviously looks pretty angry about being photographed. Um, now, um, the second thing I want to talk about is her photography of, uh, the, the third thing is her photography of women. Um, you know, the Department of Agriculture, literally, in its literature, thought of their constituency as farmers and farmers' wives, right? That not that women could be farmers. Lang was clearly struck by the fact that women, and this is a woman, were doing the same hard labor in the fields as men. And to my, this is sort of like this joke about what, what weighs more, a ton of feathers or a ton of lead. It turns out that a full sack of cotton can weigh 100 pounds. This is very, very heavy labor. Um, but here you also see something else about Lang's composition that I haven't yet talked about, which is that she actually is very interested in abstract patterns. And this is, this is the weighing, which is the portable weighing machine that she had made many pictures of. The weighing is the nexus of one of the most important transactions for a migrant farm worker because they're paid piece rate. So the farm worker wants the bag to weigh as much as possible. The owner wants the bag to weigh as little as possible. So understanding that, she also did a lot of playing with the uh, extraordinarily powerful patterns, but also showing the worker as in some ways behind or captive to uh, this act of weighing. Or consider this uh, woman, war worker. This is actually from later. This is a World War II defense plant shipbuilding worker again. This is a woman picked out of a crowd. The original is has shown uh, many more people. And it reminds us again of that the gaze is the most important skill. This woman is tough. She is also exhausted. You know just how hard she has worked all day. Um, these women uh, may be attractive, but they are never cute. Um, they can be, like this woman, delicate and tough at the same time. Now, Lang made many Madonnas. Um, migrant mother is a Madonna. This, uh, uh, 
this compositional structure of a Madonna and of the many can be said to repeat that of many Renaissance religious paintings inside the Christian tradition. Um, but this one has a remarkable set of contradictions in it, I think. On the one hand, you see this flimsy lean-to in which this woman lives with her children, and she has more children than that. Um, the, there's an extraordinary vulnerability about the way they're living, but at the same time, I think there's absolutely no mistaking the, the steely gaze in that woman's eye uh, that she is going to do what she needs to do to protect these children. She doesn't exactly seem to have a breast overflowing with milk, uh, but, and I might point out that a photograph like this could never have been distributed at the time because it would have been considered immoral to show an image of a woman's breast. But some of these Madonnas are even more startling. Um, she made many black and Mexican-American Madonnas. Um, this woman is a sharecropper from a very large plantation in Mississippi, and she earns a dollar a day as a hoer, someone who hoes cotton. Um, I find this extremely interesting. Uh, this is a woman who clearly refused to take off her sunglasses um, and um, has an almost defiant look in relation to the photographer. Uh, there are also these, which also could not have been distributed at the time, uh, pregnant women um, couldn't be pictured, and if they were, they would have to conform to the idea that pregnancy is a joyous time uh, for women, and these women, uh, for obvious reasons, appear more worried than joyous. But she also made an extraordinary number of pictures of fathers and children, and I actually think that her gendered work about men is the more interesting. There are so many photographs of fathers with children that one uh, critic uh, has called them her padanas. <laughs> this guy is particularly interesting. Um, look at him carefully. Um, he has really dolled up for this photograph. He's got bright white shoes. He could not possibly have worn those in the fields. He has combed his hair perfectly with an absolutely razor sharp uh, part. He's got very clean clothes. He's standing in a very sort of confident, assertive posture. His baby is dressed in brilliant white, uh, clean whatever. You see the, um, uh, the way his shack is built of leftover found pieces of cardboard, tin, but we also know there's a lot of information in this photograph that there's some kind of inside heating because there's a, a pipe sticking out. We see the bedding that is drying out hanging on the roof, and we also see a kind of neatness. The yard, or whatever you want to call it, has been swept. His boots are have probably been rinsed out, and they're turned upside down so that they will drain. If you look carefully, you'll see a young girl peeking out from inside the door. We don't know if she was too shy to come out or if she was told uh, by her mother or father to stay inside. Here are two more of these that I paired in part because they're from very different parts of, of the country and very different people, but they have such, uh, the, the gestures of both of them seem to me very alike as they are, their gesture toward their baby is simultaneously protective, protective and proud um, of this child. And while in a lot of this talk I've, I've given you her heavier pictures, she's very, very good at doing happy. Uh, this is a guy who just came home from a day of working in the fields, and his children and his dog are overwhelming him with their happiness to see him, and you just have the, just can really almost smell his uh, delight at, at his uh, greeting by them. These, this kind of thing contrasts sharply with many of the portraits of men alone. In the Depression, um, these 
men are often dejected, uh, they are perhaps weakened. They are men who have been unable, because of the depression, to embody a masterful masculinity. They contrast very sharply with the heroes of 1930s social realism, which are these heavily muscled uh, great workers. These are men who've been reduced by the depression, and they reflect her sensitivity to the heavy toll that the inability to support their families has taken on these men. We have here a, uh, a so-called Oki migrant farm worker, but actually the one on the top is a picture of a man in one of the Japanese-American internment camps where she also saw uh, the impact, not only of the humiliation, but the fact that you are no longer supporting your family because you and your family are simply being on the dole from the federal government. Finally, just a quick few items thinking about the body. Some of Lang's most extraordinary portraits don't have any faces shown. Uh, perhaps related to her disability, I, I don't want to psychologize this too much, but clearly this is a woman with an extraordinary sensitivity to a, the, what you might call bodily language. This is another of the highly symbolic uh, pictures that uses what I call synecdoche. The, the upturned wheelbarrow clearly is the upturned economy, and the wheelbarrow at the same time replicates the posture of this very despondent man. man. But you also see this in, um, well, this is uh, here, the um, uh, extraordinary interest in natural grace. Um, she was never very interested in photographing the disabled. Uh, it's as if she went into the opposite direction. And in these bodies, uh, the, they may be strong, but they're also eloquent, elegant in their gesture. The one on the bottom is a, a, a migrant cotton field worker. The one on the top is a photograph of a Javan the hand of a Javanese dancer. And the, uh, the gestures seem to me to be absolutely parallel. But you also see it in hard labor like this, where you really see from the, the position of the body the way that the man is putting his weight into, uh, into that plow. There's almost a dancer's awareness of, of grace. If there was any doubt about the connection between her own body and her subjects, you would see it in the many uh, photographs she made of feet. Um, feet stand for, as you see in the top picture very clearly, the, the life of hard labor and poverty. But there's also this great interest in the gracefulness of a, a posture. And uh, these are made during the Depression, but from the late 1950s, we get this uh, photograph from Vietnam, which I think is almost a paradigmatic homage to feet and grace. Um, please do not imagine that this woman's head was truncated uh, accidentally or that it was a mark of disrespect. I think Lang wanted nothing to distract us from the exquisite sinuous arc from the hand up through the arm, down through the body, and into the tight curve of the leg all the way down through the toes. And another part of the body stuff is um, showing people in relationship. Um, this is a picture of defense workers, and clearly, they're having some kind of argument. We don't know what it's about. The caption doesn't tell us anything, but you can almost feel this electricity of some kind of tension uh, between them. I, I want to just close uh, by discussing a controversy about Lang's best-known photograph, uh, uh, The Migrant Mother. And actually, when she uh, made that photograph, we, we have in various places a collection of at least six previous photographs before she got to the final one that we know very well. 
This is the first. She's still far away from the people. You see the lean-to in which they're living. I could tell you the whole story about these people, but I don't want to take any more of your time. This is a woman. She has several kids and a baby and a teenage girl. The teenage girl, uh, my guess is, just really did not want to be photographed, did not want to be involved. So Lang said, okay, we'll just do without her. Um, then um, she moves closer. Uh, at the top, you actually see the woman breastfeeding. Uh, after that, this probably took quite a while. She was probably having a number of conversations. After that, the baby has fallen asleep. The woman has covered, covered her breast. Uh, I, I don't know if Lang told her to or if she did it um, uh, by herself. Um, you see on the bottom one, one of the two um, sort of school-aged children. Um, and again at the top. Uh, the controversy about this photograph is that uh, we think that Lang asked the two children to turn their faces away from the camera. Children would certainly have been interested in the camera and seen what was going on. She did that for the exact same reason as we saw in these other compositions where she picks one person out of a crowd, and that is that she had by then realized that this woman is not only beautiful, but that she has an extraordinarily gripping and expressive face, and she does not want anything to distract the gaze from that one face where she wants it. Now, some critics say that that's a kind of cheating, and that this is therefore not documentary photography. Um, I personally think that's an absurdly simplistic view of what documentary is. It's the view that documentary just replicates. What Lang would have said in her more spiritual language was, would be that she wanted to get at something deeper than what appears on the surface, and that in order to do that, she needed to compose this photograph in a different way. I'll let you decide for yourself about what you think about it, but I'll just close uh, by uh, reaffirming this uh, notion that the skill is in the eye, and just so you know, I didn't make that up. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with one of uh, Lang's own favorite quotes, not something she said, but something she found and she really liked, and it is, a camera is a tool for learning to see without a camera. Anyway, thanks. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. I'm happy to have your questions, your comments, your criticisms, your arguments, anything that you feel moved to say, please. Do you know if Lang ever uh, returned any of the images to the people that she took pictures of? I, d I do not believe she did. Uh, the, for whatever reason, uh, when this project was being uh, developed, uh, they actually, the head actually had a meeting with the great sociologists Robert and Helen Lind and were, uh, and agreed with them that the proper uh, protocol was that you should not take anyone's names. Uh, this is a little strange by today's standards, but that was their standard. And remember that these people were very much on the move. Please, go ahead. Belinda, this was so fascinating. I learned a lot, and there's so much food for thought. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about her captions. You referred to one that was a thousand words long. Um, and in some of these, you know, you could see the sort of a magazine type of caption, but it usually only says where the picture was taken. Um, and it's interesting to me to think about somebody who was also using words to try to explain what she saw, whereas we seem to know her, and in fact your talk even focuses exclusively on the images she produced. And so I wonder how she felt about that, whether 
she ever wrote or talked about that aspect of her work being lost or underappreciated, or if it's just accepted that it wasn't as meaningful as the images and that's why it gets left behind? Or Anyway, if you could just expound a bit on the, the captions, because uh, so, I find that really fascinating. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you asked that, because I love to talk about the captions. There was a rule that you were supposed to make captions that identified place, uh, date, possibly what uh, field of agriculture. Lang soon developed a, um, a, a pattern of writing more slightly more detailed captions because, again, of this drive to individualize. So she often gave little tiny histories. This family comes from someplace in Oklahoma. First they picked this crop in this place. Then they came up here. They have five children, but one of them is still back in Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. They, no names, but a little bit of a sense of uh, these families. But as she went along, she became increasingly um, committed to the idea that pictures should go with words. This phrase, a picture's worth a thousand words, she would have wildly disagreed with that. <laughs> and she, her captions got longer. She got fewer, more and more furious because the photographs were never published with her captions. But be, she began to move into trying to do photo textual books. Now, this, she didn't invent that. There were quite a number of them coming out in that period. Um, there's one... Uh, um, uh, just really, uh, fa well, was famous at the time, done by Margaret Burke White and her husband Erskine Caldwell, um, that I think is completely awful, but <laughs> it's another story. She and Paul Taylor then decided to collaborate on a photo textual book in which the photos and the text would be absolutely equal. The text was not used to... Uh, to uh, explain the photographs, it was supplementing, and the photographs were supplementing the text. It's in print now, it's called American Exodus, but the book had the terrible luck, literally. It was published in 1939 on the day that the Russians invaded Poland. Not an auspicious day for uh, getting good news coverage, and it was really, it was also more serious and less sensationalized, but uh, it's really interesting to see what she thought about. Then she, during the 1950s, she did six commissions for life with all of which captions, and that was a complete disaster. Three of them were rejected altogether by Life magazine, and three of them uh, were, in her view, they, they insisted on putting their own captions in, and they took only the most sentimental kind of photographs, and she was just absolutely furious about it. She said that this there was like pablum, uh, that it was, you know, reduced to baby food, she thought. So uh, she certainly didn't get her way about that. My name's Chris Pullman. Returning to your comments about the posing of the children, was that speculation, or did she ever speak of it? Was that what? Speculation. Uh, uh, it's pretty much speculation by historians who have looked at the, the, the not, not by me, it's, it's yeah. actually another historian who, by the name of Curtis, who first uh, advanced that argument. But she never spoke of it. That she asked them to turn their heads, yes. Thank you. It is speculation, and it's based partly on the, on the range of the photographs, but partly on the uh, idea that kids are generally interested in a camera and what goes on. So it's not mine, but, but a lot of people have criticized her for it. So yeah, please. I'm Jill Neerim, and I wanted to say thanks for that amazing, wonderful tour Thank you. through her photographs. And to add that, that I had the exceptional good luck to meet Dorothea Lang a couple of times in two successive days in the mid-60s. Uh, and that what I came away with, I met her at the opening of the new wing of the Museum of Modern Art. I was involved in publishing photography at the time as a very junior kid to my boss, who was the big attraction. And so we talked with her in that party situation. And she was about this tall, uh, came up to about my chin, and she was wearing this riveting silver and turquoise 
almost emblematic thing around her neck. And she was one of the most powerful, charismatic humans I have ever met. And I wanted to say that because I feel as though that must have been such a feature of her being able to make the photographs that she made. Because, you know, I met her as a kid and I thought, I should drop everything and just follow her. She had that burning quality. So, I would just like to say that I would wish that we could have now a modern day Dorothy Lang because when I heard you say that in the 1930s there were those who said that those who were harmed by the depression were just lazy or um, you know, uh, soft or whatever. I think about what I read in the newspapers today as uh, the Republicans in the Congress cut food stamps and unemployment insurance and imply that these are only ways to give people disincentives to work. And we, meanwhile, we have millions of children in this country who are hungry and don't have enough to eat. So I wish that we could have someone who would document these facts. You know, um, Lang um, tried really hard to get funding for another collective collaborative photography project that would document urban life after the war. She tried to get a government project. She tried to get private foundation funding. She never succeeded. And then, shortly before her death, in 1960, she died in 1965. In 1964, she got a letter, uh, it's uh, in my book, from uh, a person who was photographing the civil rights movement. And they asked her to be a kind of mentor for a collective project of people to document what was going on then in the South. And she would have loved to do it, but she was by then uh, very much weakened by the cancer that, uh, that killed her in 1965, so she, she couldn't. But she was very proud of that. She felt, and she actually wrote in some letter to someone, to th she said something, to think that the very people I photographed 30 years ago are now standing up to uh, demand, uh, demand something different. She, she really loved that. Hi, Julie. Identify yourself. Hi, Please. I'm Julie Oranger. Uh, Linda, thank you so much. This was incredibly informative and aesthetically beautiful um, and um, wonderful to hear. So I really appreciate it. Um, because I, uh, I love the way you talked about the aesthetics of the photographs. Um, and I can see so clearly um, how profoundly influential Dorothea Lang was upon later generations of photojournalists. I'm, I'm equivalently curious about her aesthetic influence upon what we would call sort of, you know, in a narrower sense, fine arts photo photographers right now. And I'm wondering if there are any photographers who you know of who are working now who cite her as a direct influence aesthetically, perhaps. Well, uh, the answer is, I think, hundreds. Uh, for quite a while, I had a, a, this thing, this device, I guess you call it an app called the Google Alert, and every time anybody mentioned Dorothy Lang anywhere on the web, I, it would come to me, but after a while I had to give it up. But you constantly, constantly see that. Uh, furthermore, there is a Lang Taylor uh, prize for documentary work that is, for some reason, was established at the University of North Carolina. Uh, that has her name and a lot of interesting people have had it. But there's also a, a somewhat more interesting and historicized story, which is that she was terribly influential in the 30s and 40s. But in the 50s, with the rise of abstract expressionism in painting, you also get a very, very different kind of work that's called photography. Think Diane Arbus or Robert Frank, very ironic, very bitter. Uh, it actually was pioneered in, in the, you could see a transition to, through a, the work of another woman by the name of, uh, oh, I'm blanking on her name, uh, Post Walcott, uh, 
um, who was actually another woman hired by the FSA at the very end of it, and she took to doing fantastically interesting photographs of the rich. So did Esther Bubbly. And so you get a move toward something that's very different. Uh, and a lot of those people didn't like Lang's photography because it's too earnest, you might say. And I think it uh, has much, much to do with the politics of the Cold War period and an increasing kind of cynicism and pessimism. But then what you see is that this uh, acclaim of Lang uh, is reawakened in the 1950s with the civil rights movement and the other progressive movements that continued in that period. And I think it's a very interesting example of how taste in the visual uh, can be impacted by political change. But you know, I'm not a, an art critic, so I'm not gonna be able to give you particular, uh, particular names of of people, uh, uh, but I think it's a really interesting, interesting question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Leslie Amper, and um, my question has to do with the assignment that, or the directive that she was given. I know that the painters for the works of art that were um, asked during the art program were asked to. Um, paint the American scene, and those paintings are very kind of sweet and not many, not all of them, but nostalgic, and even at, that they were painted at the time, that the building of the Golden Gate and the, the uh, Cathedral of Learning, the pictures and so forth. And I'm just wondering if you think that the assignment was different, or it was the medium that caused that different flavor between the painters and the photographers? It was the assignment, very much. Um, the, you know, Roosevelt had a, a, or his administration had a very political goal in uh, having these murals painted, and they sent a lot of artists out to the smallest little towns. And this is a way of building support for the New Deal, because look what the New Deal gave us, this this beautiful thing. And a lot of those very small towns uh, were in the South. I just did a particular, uh, looked at a particular collection of just Alabama mm -hmm. uh, photographs. And I was thinking, of course, you know, this is a time when African Americans are not franchised at all in the South, and he needs Southern votes. So you have to be very cautious. They had very, very clear rules. There certainly was to be no abstraction. There's to be nothing distressing in uh, the pictures. You, you almost never see, the one group of people of color you see are American Indians, and they are usually either with tomahawks <laughs> attacking pioneers, or one of the murals I've studied actually had the temerity, if you could believe this, to show the Spanish missionaries in California teaching the Indians how to grow corn. <laughs> um, and, oh, and another one, this, this uh, involved a painting, uh, Dorothea Lang's first husband got a mural thing, and he painted a picture that had in it an Indian next to an automobile. And they made him paint out the automobile and change it into a horse. Because Indians are always prim pictured as primitive. They don't drive automobiles, they ride horses. So because of where these things are, there was much more control of that. But there were rules about the, what the FSA photographers could do, most of them uh, violated those rules um, to a small degree. I mean, they were, for example, they were never allowed to show the signs in the South that said white and colored. They were not supposed to show white and colored people in the same photograph, et cetera. But um, it's, I don't think it's the medium at all. It was the, the politics of what the New Deal wanted. Thank you. So please join me in thanking Linda Gordon for a wonderful Thank lecture. You.